Não sei. Good morning and welcome to Voice to the Voiceless. I'm your host, Ronwin Franklin, and today my guest is Cheryl LaFleur. And Cheryl is a person in recovery with lived experience of anxiety and PTSD from childhood trauma. She is a, currently a certified peer support specialist and community advocate educator. Cheryl is also a member of the Michigan Peer Recovery Coalition, which is a group of certified peers across the state of Michigan whose goal is to assist other peer-run organizations reach their missions and goals by giving them support with advocacy on the state and local levels. Cheryl has received a mental health has received mental health services both from the private sector and from public mental health services on her journey to recovery. Today she would like to talk about her experience of recovery and how a broken system can sometimes dehumanize a real human experience. She will also share her experience as a mother of a child with a lived experience of trauma and multiple multiple hospitalization. Today she is active in advocating for change to help others to increase their knowledge so that they know that there are alternative solutions for a successful recovery experience. Hi, Cheryl. How are you today? I'm doing well, Bronwyn. Thank you for having me on here. You're welcome. So tell us a little bit about, um, can you tell us a little bit about just, you know, um, why you say the mental health system is broken? The reason why I say that is because people that have a lived experience uh, with a mental health condition or substance use disorder are treated as if they don't know what they need for themselves. Um, We, and when I say we, I'm referring to, I I guess I'm gonna speak for a lot of people that probably feel like this. We feel like we're not being heard. We're supposed to be in charge of our own recovery when in fact we're being uh, many times dictated to by the health professionals that are treating us as well as whoever else is overseeing um, cases, um, they're not always asking us uh, what what we truly need or don't really listen to what we're saying. Um, And as as far as, People with lived experience, I, I also feel we don't have enough seats at the table when it comes to uh, making laws uh, that regard what we need. We are the experts in our experience and what we need, and we need more seats at the table when it comes to making decisions about what we need. Okay. So... I want to ask you kind of twofold question here. First of all, um, you you talk about having PTSD and trauma experiences. Can you tell us your definition of trauma and talk a little bit about your experience with PTSD? So my definition of trauma as it relates to my own experience is um, as a child i was repeatedly exposed to an unhealthy environment in my home Um, the abuse um, that was going on to with another family member the physical and verbal abuse um, and, and in my eyes, and it, and it was almost daily that I heard this. And um, so when it's repeated over and over and over and you're exposed to it, um, it does something to your brain. And I believe 
your uh, cortisol levels go into play and you're always in a heightened aware state, you know. So Cheryl, how did that make you feel living in with that every day? How, how did you feel? Anxious, very anxious. Um, I, I knew when my brother did something wrong and my mom said, wait till your dad gets home. After my mom had already scolded him, I'm like, no, that, that should have been enough. But as soon as I'd hear the car pull in, I knew to run to my bedroom. Um, because I knew what was going to happen. Mm. And um, there were a lot of times where I would just leave the house mm. because it was too much for me to listen to. Mm. I'm sorry you had to experience that. I'm, I, I, I have experienced similar um, abuse. Uh, of, yeah, so yeah, go ahead. Well, and, and also at, in the era that um, my parents were raised in, in the 50s, there, there was always, a, and some of you may be familiar with the saying, um, what I say goes on here, um, you know, um, I'm the king of the castle, what I say goes. Um, I worried about, I tried to be on my best behavior because when I got in trouble for something, I knew when my dad started to raise his voice at, at me, I would go get complete terror because I didn't know if I was going to get the same treatment. And I, and I remember one time um, being in the hall, we had a very small hallway in a bungalow. And I remember one time literally peeing my pants because I thought, I was going to get the bell or something like that, but um, it was run more like a dictatorship, I felt like, mm -hmm. um, and we were not allowed to speak um, what our needs were, what our voice, what we needed, you know, um, or we couldn't say anything against what the rules were wow. or, you know. I'm sorry you went through that. So can you tell me what is peer support and what does peer support mean to you? Peer support is, um, well, me and you both are peer support specialists. Yes. Um, we're certified by the state, but a peer support is somebody who has a lived experience of a mental health or condition or substance use disorder that, um, uh, uses their coping skills and their assistance or support, whatever, wherever it may have come from, that has assisted them into their recovery and they support other people with lived experience. Uh, in our case, as a certified peer, we have been trained by the state um, with specialized training and um, so that we are able to be employed either independently or by the public mental health system to assist those that are receiving services. And we use our experience to um, share our stories um, to so that they can find us relatable. So they understand, wow, someone understands what I'm going through. And um, as a certified peer, we've also been trained in different state trainings that allow us to run peer run groups to pass on different coping skills, uh, which are extremely helpful for a person that's receiving services. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So talk talk about talk about what led you to seek treatment and then what led to the hospitalization. So I you know due to the constant exposure to the trauma, I, you know, had anxiety. And so um, I believe it became a part of me. And as I got older, as I eventually got away from my home, I, I did meet my ex-husband and we got married and I eventually had two children. Uh, but I know, you know, I noticed um, after my second child that my anxiety was more I was more on edge. Um, it might have been 
highly hormonal, for all I know. Uh, but I've had different family members saying to me, um, oh, wow, you snap easily, or, um, you know, what's wrong with you? You know, why do you, you know, how you react? You know, you don't seem like yourself. So I started listening and, and started talking to friends and um, anxiety goes with a lot of diagnosis, but I had a friend tell me one day, I think maybe you have depression. So I looked it up, I'm like, maybe she's right. Um, so I feel like I went along with what I heard in media and um, what at that time, that was in maybe 1997 or nine, yeah, somewhere around there that I, um, uh, yeah, this sounds, this, this could be me. And, and I know that there's pills out there and um, maybe I should go seek treatment. So I took myself to a um, health professional in the private sector. And I said, I think I might have depression. And so that's when um, all the different prescriptions for antidepressants started. And I could go on and on about um, the whole medication experience, but that's a whole nother podcast. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because we can go on for hours about that. But um, what that led to was um, in actuality, I had anxiety and PTSD and um, nobody asked me what happened to you. They just went with what I was talking about and then went with their clinical um, definitions. And I started with different doctors and switching different pills. Um, and a lot of the times, I think in the beginning, I tried something herbal and it seemed to help, but it wasn't enough. Um, and then I went with the uh, medical professionals and it just uh, seemed like from there, um, things went downhill for me. Um, is when I truly became clinically depressed where I didn't, I didn't have suicidal ideations, but I started having them and I never correlated it with my treatment, but I just thought, well, maybe I need another pill, maybe I need another pill. Um, and after a couple years, I had different life circumstances going on in my life with, within my marriage and things like that. And um, I was having, I didn't know how to deal with these emotions I was having. And at the time I was on another pill to help me sleep at night. And my anxiety, anxiety was off the charts one day. I just, um, something I never experienced before. Um, my thoughts were, were racing and my skin was literally burning and I called um, the online and I got somebody I've never uh, worked with before. It was on call. And they told me that that medication that you take for sleep, you can you can take that on an acid basis for anxiety. So it wasn't too long after that when um, I started having suicidal ideations uh, where one day I was co coming up with a plan. I literally didn't know how to stop myself. I didn't know where the thoughts were coming from, but I was making my plan. I was finalizing things. And the I, I had it, everything planned. Um, it's I burned letters. I made sure my kids' laundry was made, was done. I didn't want I didn't want my ex to have to deal with things, but in my mind, I had to make things set so that they would be okay without me. And my rational thinking was out the window. I did not think about what my kids' life would have been like without me. I just wanted the pain to end. I know, I know that feeling. 
and I went through everything. I um, decided I was going to take my prescription. I had the bottle in my hand. I even had it down to what song I wanted to hear as I was going. And something inside me um, was struggling against these thoughts and my rational voice, something inside me said, I need an angel. I need someone to stop me. And within five minutes, my best friend called and I said, you are my angel. And she's like, what? And she's like, what's going on? And I told her what was happening to me and she stayed on the phone with me and you know, got me into rational thinking. If it wasn't for her, I don't know what would have happened, but God answered my prayer and my angel called me. Um, I put in a call to my doctor and I told her what happened. And at that point, I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel safe from the way I was feeling. And I called my ex-husband at the time and I said, "I, I think I need to go to the hospital. Um, my doctor helped me because I didn't feel safe with what I I was about to do. And I wanted to go somewhere where I would feel safe again. So I checked myself in and my best friend went with me. Okay. Okay. And what was that experience like for you um, doing the hospital? How long were you there? And what was that, that like? It was... Um, I don't know what word to use. It was interesting to say the least. Um, and that doesn't even describe it. I was in for a total of a week, but it felt like to me, every day felt like it dragged, like it was a lifetime. Um, I was scared. I, I was meeting people. I was, I didn't know anybody. Um, I had one roommate and I was um, visited by different people. I was, you know, from what I remember, I um, did what they had asked me. You know, I got cleaned up every day. I went to have my meals. And it was very awkward the first day or two because I didn't know anybody and what I was You know, I saw people walking in the hallways that were talking to themselves. I mean, everybody's experience and why they were there were different. Um, In the beginning, I wanted to just be in my room and not do anything. I was not sure what was going on. And I had a social worker or clinician coming in and and saying, are you going to participate in group? And I said... I don't really feel up to it. And her response was, if you don't participate and attend these sessions, you are not going home. Mm -hmm. And that terrified Mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, you want to get out of here. Mm -hmm. You better go to these groups. Mm -hmm. Because um, at that point, I realized that my decisions were not my own. So I reluctantly went to a few, some, um, with some of the group sessions, I made a couple friends. We would uh, gather in the one girl's room and listen to music and we would get in trouble for that. Um, You need to be in bed by this time. But we we, um, formed a little, um, we formed this little friendship and we were supporting each other and we went through our therapy homework together so we kind of became like a little a little close-knit little group and Mm -hmm. wanted to have a little fun and we weren't allowed to do that we would be sent back to our rooms um another part that i felt was kind of odd was i was walking around well let me backtrack a bit i um, and actively exercise. And back and at that time, I think it was in 2001, I was regularly going to the gym three days a week, um, lifting weights and 
on my cardio machine at home three days a week. Okay. So I wanted to have a little bit of normalcy in my life. I knew how therapeutic my exercise was. So I would walk the hallways with the girls. And one day I saw an exercise bike and it was a stationary bike and it was kind of hidden in a room. The door happened to be open where they did the laundry. Mm -hmm. And I had asked the staff, am I allowed to use this? And they said, sure, you know, on your free time. So I started to use it and um, people would come in there and see me on there and they would look at me like I was kind of odd or something. Um, so on one of the days, I think the second day after I used it, um, I'm in the morning I had had a clinician come in and they said, well, we have staff reporting to us about your exercise, your excessive exercise. <laughs> and we're questioning if you have OCD. Oh my. And I looked at them and I said, no, oh. I do not have OCD. I exercise on a regular basis. I can't believe you're even questioning me about this. You know, I, at that point I got, I was really angry and I'm like, wow, this is really degrading. I felt degraded. And at that point, I, I'm like, I cannot wait to get out of here. I felt like this, this was the way things were ran and the way they ordered you around and the way they didn't listen to your needs felt like it, it felt very dehumanizing to me. Mm, it sounds like and it was. All I told myself was do everything they said and get your butt out of here. Mm -hmm. And, you mm -hmm. know, I had my wits about me. I had, you know, my doctor visiting me and I'm like, I'll, I'll be better when I go home, blah, blah, blah. And I told myself that I would never go to the hospital ever again, that I did not want to have to experience that. Um, and I had not gone back. I can relate to that. I can relate. I can relate to that. So how would it have felt if there was more peer support empowerment for you? How tell tell me about that. How how becoming well, now, a, right. Now that I know what peer support is, I think that would have made a huge difference had I been visited by somebody that talked to me like from a human, a human perspective instead of from a clinical perspective. I really think that I would not have had this experience. I would have felt hurt. I would have talked to people that were related, relatable. Um, but that, but in that, everything that happened. I, it just made me realize, God, you really need to take charge of your life because you don't want this happening again. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, eventually I did get divorced and was out on my own. And I had other experiences that were um, difficult to me. I was in a very vulnerable state. But um, it eventually led me to want to seek out becoming a peer support specialist. Mm -hmm. And how has um, that empowered you? Well, what happened in the beginning was I, but prior to that, I wanted to um, feel empowered. I wanted a job. I wanted um, to support myself. And everything I tried failed. I went back to school and uh, I tried a couple different things and I, those jobs did not work out for me. I was fired. Uh, I was, I didn't, I don't think I had enough insight into my, what I really needed for myself. I only knew what I, what I did, but I researched for quite a while and I heard about this profession called the peer support and I'm like, you know, what ended up happening was I 
ran out of my private insurance. I had COBRA insurance from the divorce and I needed to still get treatment, which led me to the public sector. And then that's when I felt like I was more supportive. I had met this lady who called herself a peer support specialist and I didn't really know what she was talking about, but, um, and I didn't really see her often, but I had a wonderful case manager and she was with me the entire time of my treatment there. I know there's a lot of turnover, but she was great. She really helped me to achieve goals and, um, what happened was, is I had some unfavorable experience with going to my, the office one day for help. And I had the customer service representative call me one day and I was advocating for myself. I had like a fire lit under me. Mm -hmm. And she's like, have you thought of becoming a peer support specialist? I said, yeah, I have. I'm actually trying to. And she actually gave me some assistance. So I think about two years later is when I um, finally became employed. And that's, um, I believe, my real journey began because when you start to help other people, it starts to empower you and it reinforces your own recovery. And when I had people telling me, you, you know, um, if it wasn't for you, I would not have gone back to school or, you know, thank you, for thank you for teaching me this, or um, you just can tell that they, they looked up to you because of your experience, but I never ever treated them that, like they were beneath me. I wanted them to feel what I felt someday. And, um, and you can tell that they, admired working with the peer support because they didn't get that from the case manager. They didn't have the empathy mm -hmm. that we're able to offer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. I definitely agree. So Cheryl, you mentioned that you have a son with um, lived experience and multiple hospitalizations. Would you want to share or are you willing to share? Is that okay if you talk about some of that with us today? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I spoke with him on the phone this morning and we had a, a conversation and I, I just wanted to make sure it was okay with him that I shared because he knows um, how important my work is. Um, my son is currently um, 24 years old, but he was um, a teen at the time. Um, He's had three hospitalizations and when things were happening to him, um, I was informed by my ex-husband, um, the first time it happened, I'm taking him to the hospital and meet me there. He started telling me what was going on and it was like blowing my mind, this behavior he told me about that I, that I wasn't aware of because he wasn't with me at the time. And well, as I can describe when I saw him there was, and I'm going to use the term extreme state of mind. Mm -hmm. I don't like to use the clinical term psychosis. Okay. Um, he was talking nonsense and we, we just did what we felt was best for him. And he had his first hospitalization. He was quite young. Um, when I say quite young, I believe he might have been 15, mm -hmm. um, I think. Um, and I believe they started giving him medication and they were trying to give him a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And um, he would start to do better. And then I remember um, his second hospitalization and I don't remember the span of time, but I um, met my ex-husband. We, you know, I, we said, I think it's best if we hospitalize him again. And we did, and he went to a different place 
for holding and then they got him into a hospital and I would be on the phone with him and I would go visit him but he would tell me the things that were going on and it was like eating me up inside because I wanted him to feel safe but I didn't like what he was telling me. It was the third time he was hospitalized that really um, was the worst experience that I ever went through with him. Um, at that point, my my ex and I were on the phone constantly, and my ex was afraid, you know, the things he was doing and saying. Um, my husband, ex-husband, was locking his room at night because he was afraid he was going to point and get physically attacked. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I will get to you as to why his behavior was the way it was. But at the time, not knowing what was going on, he was doing some very unsafe things. Um, he burned some, burned some magazines in the yard and almost started a fire and buried them. Buried the buried it. He that something about the books he needed. He didn't want them around. There was some paranoid paranoia going on. So I, um, my ex was at work, and I said, you know what? I'm going to go over there, and I'll take care of it this time. So at that point, I stopped being a mother, and I became a peer support specialist because I knew that I wouldn't be able to handle. How to handle him, I had to treat him like a client instead of a child mm. Mm. because it wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to handle it. So he was talking nonsensical and we sat there for quite a while and um, I was validating him the best I could, but I also felt that I needed him somewhere safe. Okay. So I secretly secretly called the police department and asked them i said he is not going to go to the hospital on his own and this is the first time we had the police take him in and i waited there for them to come while they took him and he willingly went and i met them over at this hospital er holding eventually well, I didn't know what transpired until I got there, but he was in the ER holding and he was in four point restraint mm. and he was, and he was also chemically restrained. Mm. And I, at that point I became the mom mm -hmm. and I was asking them, what is, what is going on? And they said he was uh, becoming physically disruptive. He punched one of our interns in the stomach and we had to sedate him to calm him down. He was, you know, your son is very strong. We had to restrain him. And I looked at my baby laying in the bed and I didn't even recognize him because I didn't know what it meant to be chemically restrained, but if someone's not aware of that they shot him up with a cocktail of Haldol and then maybe add a van, I don't know what they used, but he was laying there and, you know, he was, he was 18 at the time. And that's, that was one of the reasons why I had to call the cops because I knew that, um, he was an adult, but he, even though technically he was an adult, I knew he would, would not have made the choice. So it was, it was a really painful experience for me to watch him in this chemical restraint. It was agonizing for me because I was watching him. He was out, but yet he was struggling to break free. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I don't know if it was two hours later, they or three hours, I don't remember what it was, but they came in and he was he was being a little combative. He was in the four point and they gave him another cocktail to calm mm -hmm. him down. Mm -hmm. And 
my heart was just ripping out of me because I was talking to him and telling him I'm not going to leave your side. And I was saying everything soothing I could say to him, but I don't even know if he could really hear what I was saying. I was just praying to God that some of what I was saying would get through to him. That sounds so hard. Sorry you didn't do that. I, I, I sat there and I would be on the phone with my ex who was at work and I says, I am not leaving his side. I am not leaving his side until you get here. I don't know how, I don't care how long late you're working. I am not leaving his side. So six hours total had gone by. And I got on the phone with a mutual friend of ours, another peer support specialist. And I told her what was going on and her husband got involved. He's, they're like, wait a minute, how long has he been in a restraint? I said, six hours. Oh my and goodness. they said, they, they says, as far as we know, but let me just confirm that the, the policy reads that they are to only be in four point for four hours. And at that point, they're supposed to have them in a two point restraint. Mm -hmm. Wow. And when I heard that, I suddenly became the lioness protecting her cub. Yeah. And and her husband's on the phone with me. He's another peer supporter. And he's saying, you need to ask that charge nurse to produce that policy manual. He says, by law, they're supposed to have a policy manual. And you need to find her and ask her to see it. And your son is not supposed to be in four point restraint. So I was walking out of there, raising hell, looking for this nurse. Mm -hmm. And I finally found her. And I said, why is my son still in four point restraint? He's not supposed to be in four point restraint. I said, where is your policy manual? She couldn't produce it. Mm. Then it became a fight. It, I was literally battling it out with her. Mm. And at that point, she said, do you realize we can press charges against your son? He punched one of our interns, and this is why he is being restrained. I said, my son is here because he has a mental health condition and he needs help. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I realized he suddenly was not a, a psych, um, possible psych admission that he was suddenly a criminal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that made me furious. And she couldn't produce this manual. So I, they wouldn't get on, they would stay, they stayed on the phone with me. And um, I said, I want to see the doctor in charge. I was, I was furious. So finally this doctor comes in and he says, I said, someone is supposed to check on him every two hours. I've been here for six hours. Only one person came in and checked on him and they gave him some another shot. I said, and I've been here four hours later and no one's been in here to check on him. Mm. He's supposed to be in a two point restraint at the four hour mark if he's not combative. If you still have him in a, in a four point restraint. So at that point, he came, he, they got somebody in there to take the two and they have him in a two point. And I had some sort of relief. Mm -hmm. And um, I waited for my ex to get there. And um, at this point, he, we, he was finally in a facility where I felt was one of the best places he was in. And it, we had a, a discharge. Um, so I had a discharge session with the social workers. There were six people present, which was a great experience. Um, they were all, they all seemed like they cared about what was going to happen after he left. And I, I found out after that time of his stay, I found out through talking with him and um, through my ex and through the clinicians that he revealed that he was um, molested, 
by a school friend mm. when he was younger. Oh my. And I was, I didn't know what to feel, but at this point I realized he was a trauma survivor. Yes. And his experience, I no longer saw him as um, a person with, with, um, as a psych person, a person with a mental health condition, I saw him as somebody who was traumatized and I don't know how to express this. I saw him as a, as a traumatized individual who needed more help than I could give him mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. any of the help he was receiving. Okay. And I knew he was 18, but I also knew um, that we we needed to still see him as a vulnerable child that still needed our guidance. Because even though he's 18, they still our kids are still vulnerable. They mm -hmm. need us for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. So um, eventually, he he started getting more insight and. Um, started um, working. He found something he was successful in. And mind you, my this kid is a brilliant, brilliant boy. At the age of 10, he was in the National Geography Bee, wow. the Michigan, the Michigan, I should say the Michigan Geography Bee. He placed 10th and almost went to the national. Nice. Um, he he's a he's a whip smart kid and he reads he would ask me at the age of 10 to get him um theodore roosevelt's autobiography um he was reading and i'm like this kid's gonna be a politician you know <laughs> and so when i after he was going through all this i'm like what happened to my brilliant boy and so as he was um getting insight and getting better i knew that um his line of work he chose, he chose to go into a plumbing apprenticeship. Um, it, it, he had a goal, he had something, something that made him feel human, that made him um, work hard to be better. It gave him a purpose. Right, right. And we have to have a purpose right. in order to be sex successful in recovery. Yes. So, um, he still had, he still has private insurance, but he, with the insurance he has, he, he would call me once in a while because he, he had to keep going. And every time he went, he had a new psychiatrist. He never mm -hmm. had the same one. Mm -hmm. And he told me about his experience, how he felt dehumanized. He was mad one day. He says, mom, I told him that I wanted to own my own plumbing business one day. And, and the person looked at me and said, really? Aww. He looked at me like, like, you're never going to be able to do this. Yeah. He said, I felt, I says, I don't want you seeing him again. <laughs> I knew he had a, a mind of his own, but I said, we need to find you someone else. So <laughs> I was in the phone book. I'm looking for other people um, he could possibly see, found names for him. But the insurance that he has, he has to stay within that health system mm. and see clinicians within that health system. Mm. So um, it wasn't until uh, the pandemic when he had decomped uh, because he lost his job. And Peter was doing well all those years and he was the age of 24, no, 23 at the time. And he calls me one day and says, mom, I'm having nightmares. I'm having nightmares and flashbacks. And at that point I knew that the pandemic and being isolated um, triggered him. They had also changed his medication, which was the worst thing they could have done. And he started decomping and um, it seemed like a matter of days. He just went downhill and started having extreme states of mind. And at that point I knew 
where it was coming from. I knew how to handle him and I, but I couldn't do it from afar. I was on the phone. I couldn't see him. Um, and my ex and I knew the last place for him was to be in the hospital. And it was the most draining, horrifying experience for me to try to help him on the phone, um, to try to get him in a stable place. And um, it was tearing me up. It was, I was trying to hold myself together. My, my own wits about me were, were slowly going away because I was isolated too. Right, and right. it was, it was, it was just, um, as a parent, it was just, I, I can't even begin to describe it. It just was horrifying. And I, um, finally, when he did, um, stabilize again, um, and I discussed with him and I says, we really need to get you where you need better help. You, you need therapy. And I says, I can't make you go, but when you're ready, you need to talk about this because you're going to, you can feel better now, but even those nightmares are still going to come. Those thoughts and uh, memories are going to creep up on you. Um, he had been in therapy with this child psychologist who knew um, what was happening, but um, I had permission to talk to him. And he, he said, I can only help your son so much. I, I don't specialize in trauma therapy. I work with with young, young children and um, he can only help them so far or, or so much. So he's doing well today. He's He's 24, he's employed. No, he's 25 now. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, he's, I'm losing track, but he yeah. had his 25th birthday and I've had the discussion with him again. We need to get you, um, find you another clinician because you're only gonna be on your dad's insurance until you're 26. So this is where I'm at right now. Um, okay. I, he said he did some research on his own and found another place, but I don't know what's going to happen if he's going to end up with Medicaid um, mm -hmm. and if these new people he found on his own will take Medicaid. So that's that's where we're mm -hmm. at right now with him and um, he's doing well. He's, he's very proactive um, and whenever he tells me I don't want to talk about it, I know to back off. Okay, so that leads me to this question when we're going through this mental health system why are we not given choices and why do you feel that it's important for us to be able to have choices i believe we're not giving choices number one because there aren't enough out there not enough what number, out there there's not enough choices out there okay um there is not enough people out there that know, number one, what peer support is. The state of Michigan had just in the last couple of months, I believe, opened our first peer respite, which I think is something important we need to touch on. Mm -hmm. um, there, the peer supports come from a lived experience. I believe that there are in some hospitals they're they're advocating to have peer supports working in the ERs, but there's not enough of them. And even if they are working in the ERs, the person's only choice is to be hospitalized. Mm -hmm. We now know that in other states there are peer respite homes. Mm -hmm. There's um, about fifty throughout the country. Yes. And a peer respite home is, is a home that is independently run by peer support specialists. So when somebody goes into crisis, they have that choice that they can go to this home where they're treated by people with lived experience, where no clinician is going to come in 
and say, well, let's, maybe we need to change your medication. They come to them from a place of empathy. When it comes to trauma, nobody's asking from the medical model, what happened to you? Right. They are saying, what is wrong with you? Why so are you broken? Says, it's broken. Mm -hmm. That's a very broken system. So mm -hmm. when somebody goes to peer respite, they are treated with empathy. They're asked, what do you need? They are given the resources. They are given the support from a place of empathy. And they are treated with dignity and respect. And they are treated with a human experience. Mm -hmm. We now only have one peer respite in our state. And when I found out it was going to be opened, the first person I called was my son. And I said, I just want you to know that there is progress. And if something, God forbid, I hope doesn't happen again, but if something ever happens to you again, I have hope that you will be able to get help and treated with a more human experience. And I said, and I, and he knows that I work with the Michigan Peer Recovery Coalition and our group is actively, we have a peer, peer respite committee. We are actively um, working to get more peer respites in the state of Michigan. And it's, it, and I don't want to say it's a struggle, but I have hope. We have one open now, and I believe that if we can get the word out, that we can let other parents know that this is something that is needed, um, that you can have another choice as long as we have more choices out there. Um, if they know what a peer respite is and we need something done, like talk to our legislators or whatever, it's it can be done, but people need to know more about it. They need to know that this option exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, alternative uh, states of um, care and treatment, I think, is important. Um, well, when I was talking about choices, I, I'm thinking back on the fact that when we go into these treatment facilities and we're not being heard, that's another way of taking away our choices because you know we've been we're being told what medications we can take what medications we can't take um how long we can stay in hospitalization and then there's the coercion and manipulation of if you don't do this so we lose choice there too and yes. you said something about your son when he found purpose and having purpose and purpose comes out of choices and i was i was tagging into that when i was talking about why aren't we giving these choices when we go into treatment or in hospitalizations and why are having choices when we're in treatment or hospitalizations important what are your thoughts on that well it goes back to, to me when I found, I found my purpose in life when I became a peer support specialist. And I'm not saying every person that's going into recovery has to become a peer support specialist, but that was my purpose. I had something that I wanted to live for, something that I woke up to every day and, and looked forward to going to that job. Mm -hmm. And in my son's experience it's it's the plumbing apprenticeship that is what keeps him going and he knows it that's his, his purpose and he's very goal driven now okay um when people are not given the resources to to know that they can be empowered and that they can find their purpose in life they, I actually feel like there's a lot of people that aren't aware of their choices and they give up and they're stuck in the system. 
and without going into too much detail, we are losing a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So how is that? Pierce... Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, there's people that are stuck in the system that don't, that aren't aware of their choices and that are overly medicated and that they're not, they eventually are dying. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not their mental health that's, that's doing it to them. Mm -hmm. It's the side effects from the medications mm -hmm. and, um, and the physical problems that, that they eventually create right. and, and not having that quality of life mm -hmm. that they deserve to have. Mm -hmm. It slowly diminishes. Yeah. So to their to the point where they're not I don't feel they're human anymore. Right. And and, and you we were taught you were talking about this and that brought to mind when when working with peer support, because like you mentioned earlier, I'm a peer support specialist as well, certified when we work with individuals i think the peace state helps us empower them is we we help them see that they have choices we help mm -hmm. this we help them see that they can set goals and that we will help them reach those walk, walk alongside of them to reach those goals we let we let them know that they have purpose and that brings them back to hope and, we, and, and and those things, having choices, having empowerment, having goals, having purpose, for me, and I'm not, I don't know about you, but for me, those were, were the things that helped fuel my journey of mental health recovery. I, I think the, the biggest word you said there, Ron, was hope. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because when somebody does not have something to hope for, they're not going to strive for their goals. They're not going to. Um, they're not going to try. They're not going to attempt to reach their goals because if they feel like they're going nowhere, then then why should I try? Um, a peer support is a beacon of hope. They look at they they look at us and say, "Wow." look at how they're living i can do that too that gives them hope and it makes them fight for what for their goals whatever mm -hmm. goals that they are setting in their life mm -hmm. it empowers them mm -hmm. so cheryl i got a couple of more questions mm -hmm. um if you have time of so course. right now if a person was going through an altered state of being because that's what i like to call um, uh -huh. mental health conditions, and they are having some 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 challenges right now, and they're in an altered state. Uh -huh. Um, they've never been in the hospital. Uh -huh. They've never been on medications, uh -huh. and this seems to have been a real break, re a recent break. Are there any places in in the area that they can go to and seek some support without going to an hosp a hospital? There are independent peer run organizations. Um but they have to be aware that they exist. Mm hmm mm hmm Would you name uh, name a few? Name a few. Well, there's there's network three one three solutions that I say correctly. Yes. Three one three network solutions. Three one three, okay, I had it backwards. Oh, um, that's fine. Uh which is of course is run by Bronwyn. <laughs> um there is an I don't know all the letters. Uh, art? Is it art? art? Is that the one that Anne has? And yes, um, and the, if, 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 if you listeners do go to our Michigan Peer Recovery Coalition, the Michigan Peer Recovery Coalition Facebook page, you will see a list of many of these organizations. Um, our webpage, we're, we're looking to put the resources out there so people can find 
um, all of these peer-run organizations. There is, um, the peer respite is Hope 365. Um, oh, you know, <laughs> with my, with it being early in the day and, and not having a good night's sleep last night, my brain is, I cannot list these off. It's um, okay. It's fine. It's okay. But a lot, a lot of these independent run organizations are called drop-in centers mm -hmm. and they are run by peer supports mm -hmm. and um, I, I, <laughs> Help me out here. No, no, you're doing great. I appreciate I appreciate you, you know, giving the time to 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 answer that question for me. And we are coming right up on a little over an hour. So I wanna ask you yeah, I wanna ask you one final question. What what would you like our listeners to know and what would you say that they can do? What what would be helpful? What kind of things they can do to help? If, whether you're a person with a lived experience or have a child with peer experience, if you hear what we're saying and you find that there is importance or significance to this discussion and believe that these choices need to be more available, especially getting the word out um, as far as drop-in centers and uh, what a peer support is asking asking for one or telling somebody else if they if they have a child in distress you your child could benefit from a peer support or or if you really know or believe that peer respites are more needed in our state talk to your talk to your local state representatives get a hold of us on the Michigan Peer Recovery Coalition. Send us a message. We we will get um, help you with trying to find who you can talk to. Whatever whatever we can do, there's power in numbers. Mm -hmm. We need to get this information out there. People need choices. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl, for being with us this morning. I appreciate you coming on, and I want you Thank to know. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I, oh, your story matters. Your story, ma your son's story matters. All our stories matter, and we all have one. And I appreciate your vulnerability this morning and sharing that. So um, I want to wish you happy holidays, and yeah. Same to you, Bronwyn. I hope you have a wonderful holiday.